Good morning. Let me say that again. Good morning. All right. Well, that was for my benefit. I didn't come across very well on that one. Uh, good to have you with us today in worship. It is such a beautiful day, and we can worship God in this beautiful place, in this area, and uh, appreciate all the wonderful farmers who are harvesting their crops and the change of weather and all that, and it's just joyful. Uh, yesterday, we, I had the chance to celebrate Trina Delser's wedding, and uh, what a wonderful time. We had 300 people <laughs> outdoors, and it was fun. So we want to just uh, wish her happy with uh, Bruce Qual as her husband, and uh, Bruce and now Trina Qual. Uh, wonderful people, and it was a joy to have them. This morning, I want to say thank you to the people who make up our worship team, and Jim and Linda, our Lorraine, back here, as usual, and also Marge, we appreciate your sharing your music with us today. Behind your organ rather than, than uh, the, the accordion, right? right. <laughs> Good. And our coffee, coffee hour hosts are, are uh, uh, Cheryl and Dan Berry, and uh, also Ingrid's going to be our lay reader, and Jerry's going to lead the singing. So what a wonderful group. We have some announcements to share with you. In the basement, we continue to have a sale, a silent auction, and also there's some items that you can just put money in to uh, go towards the parking lot maintenance. Uh, we're going to reseal and patch the parking lot. Uh, part of it will be done this fall. The rest will be done next spring. So we're, we're doing really well. I'm not sure where we are, but we're close. So, so be generous. Uh, outbid your neighbor. Right? Make sure those items don't go cheaply. There's some wonderful items down there. Um, also, next Sunday at 12 o'clock, we're going to do Daryl Trice committal service over here in Silent Vale. And so you are, Joyce shared with me that you're welcome to come. Stay on, you come for worship and stay on for that. And then, uh, Joyce, you said you're going to have something at your, your place afterwards. Is that Oh, Rock and K Ranch. Yeah, okay. All right. So we'll make sure people get that directions. The lunch, yeah. We'll meet here, and then we'll go over and do the committal serves. Uh, also, I have an announcement. The uh, Our Savior's Lutheran Church of Dalton uh, is going to celebrate their centennial anniversary next Sunday, September 26th, at 1030 Worship. 12 o'clock meal, 2 o'clock program. And everybody's welcome to attend. That's where Tom and Jane Junkert uh, were. And so they're going to be back, and they're going to be here with us on October 3rd. So uh, he, he's not he, just in the service, but not preaching, but he's going to be here. Now, I think that is all. Those are all the announcements this morning. Uh, anybody got more? Yes, I was... Leaving the best until last. Phyllis has a birthday today. Okay, Phyllis. We won't ask you how old you are. I don't care. You know, <laughs> but let's sing happy birthday to her. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Phyllis. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Uh, unfortunately, we also announced that Merv is back in the hospital, so we want to continue praying for him and for, for Phyllis as she cares for him. So they're tough times. Other announcements or prayer concerns that we'd have this morning? Okay, Inger's going to come up and call, use a call to worship. Good morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The, the old, old has, has gone, gone away. away. The, the new, new has come. come. All this is from God who re reconciled us to God through Christ. We, we received, received God's, God's ministry, ministry of reconciliation, reconciliation and commit to spreading the message. 
As God counts not our sins against us, neither do we count other sins against them. We, we are, are therefore, therefore Christ's Christ ambassadors, ambassadors as God, God makes an appeal through us. us. Let us worship God. And the hymn of praise is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, number 358. before we reveal them to you. You know our joys and fears before we name them to you. You offer us mercy while we cringe at the expectation of judgment and punishment. In spite of our weaknesses, our failures, our doubts, you invite us into your presence. Knowing we are in your presence, we confess our sins before you. Quiet time for confession. Jesus shared these words of good news. I leave behind with you peace. I give you my own peace, and my gift is nothing like the peace of this world. Friends, believe the good news. In, In Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ we, we are forgiven. forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And the response is number 482, Sanctuary. <laughs> The 
first scripture lesson is from the letter of Paul to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do not out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. And the second scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. This is the word of the, word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And the choir is singing now. <laughs>
day to see all my friends so dear to me at that old country church. I would come by for prayer, everybody would be there at that old country church. As you, as you sang that, uh, couldn't help but remember my experience at the old country church. Uh, it was southeastern Kentucky. It was uphill both ways. It was hot. It was the, the roads were dusty, but the fellowship was outstanding. You know, and it's a little church, and actually I wasn't always Presbyterian. I was a church of Christ. They don't believe in instrumental music. Singing was terrible. But... The church was wonderful, the old country church where you can really support and encourage each other. So before we share in the sermon, let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks and praise that you are with us. And this old country church still is here and that we can proclaim your word and encourage and support people. We thank you for that. Help us to hear again the familiar words of scriptures, and help us to apply those words to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Do you like happy endings? Yes. I love happy endings. You know, uh, Hollywood used to produce movies with happy endings. You could count on it. It would always be a happy ending. Today, that's not so much the case. But there's an old story about uh, Hollywood producer Sam Goldwyn. And Billy Wilder was his uh, director and did a lot of movies for him. So one day he came in to Goldman's office, and, and he says, I've got a story for you. Let me share this with you. And it's about a famous artist, and I think it would just make a great movie. And he shared the story, and Goldman says, does it have a happy ending? And he said, well, no, uh, the guy ended up in an insane asylum thinking he was a horse. <laughs> and Goldman threw him out of the out of his office. Get out of here. So, so Wilder wasn't going to give up and he poked his head back in and he says, what if the horse went on to win the Kentucky Derby? <laughs> My friends, we love a happy ending. And Paul talks about a happy ending. And he talks about the church. Paul's got a great hope. And I do too. You know, with all the troubles the church has had over the years, I still have that great hope that the church is that community on this earth where God's purpose and plan and presence can be lived out in our lives. And we can be Christ to each other. I still have that. 
A task force for membership growth in the Presbyterian Church came up with this understanding of the church. They wrote, God's intent is that there be a human community that enjoys God's presence, reflects God's image, and cares for God's earth. Enjoys God's presence, reflects God's image, and cares for the earth. That's a pretty good description of the church. That's a good description of who we are. You know, Paul is talking about the church when he writes this passage in Philippians, the letter to the Philippians. He says, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any incentive of love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord in one mind. Do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which you have in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul's not talking about the world. He knows that the world is always going to have problems, lots of problems. And there's going to be hatred, and there's going to be war, and there's all these things are going to go on. But Paul is talking about the church, who we are, right here, Main Presbyterian Church, and churches throughout this world. My friends, I've traveled a lot of places in the world, both east and west. And every time we get together with Christians, no matter where it is, no matter if it's a little little dumpy shack someplace in the backwoods or a great cathedral. There is a qualitative difference in the relationship than if we're just meeting with anybody. And I just let me share you with, with you one example of that. Years ago, before the Berlin Wall came down, when the East was still communist, we took a group to the, to the eastern part of Europe to encourage Christians. It was a bit of a risk, but I remember going to Berlin, and, uh, and we had a uh, meeting with this one pastor and some of his parishioners, and we, it was kind of clandestine. We parked the van around the corner from where this pastor's uh, apartment was, and it was at night, and then we kind of one by one, not all together, made our way to these stairs that went up this old apartment building. And the stairs were dimly lit. And we came up to the top of that stairs, went into this room, and there sat 13 German, pretty much early college students, and his, their pastor. There was a glow to that room. I mean, there was something about that in experience that was so different than what you could imagine just going up and meeting somebody. And we had the most wonderful evening and the most hopeful evening because they were in Christ. They were in Christ. You see, if you want to know what the difference is, you just look at this passage where Paul talks about if there's any encouragement or any, any love or any participation, but always after each one of those phrases, there's an implied in Christ. And if you look at the Greek, which every once in a while I do. No expert, but I look at that. And we find that that phrase means that Christ is coming up alongside us to be a comforter and to be an encourager. My friends, Christ is our unseen companion. And that's the difference. It's when we get together as Christian bodies. That's the difference from that and the world. My friends... Can you imagine what Paul's talking about here? I mean, it's not just some theory. Paul is talking about the church. He is talking about what we can experience right now. I have long been convinced <clears throat> that Christ's message has to be embodied somewhere, and that's in the church. We need an embodiment of Christ's message we can't just make it theoretical and sound good and all that, but it actually has to work someplace. And I've always been convinced, wherever I've served as a pastor, that we need to work on, on applying those principles in our lives. 
because God doesn't just want us to be nice. Minnesota nice is great, isn't it? But God wants us to be transformed. Not just nice, but be transformed. My friends, I think this is the crux of the matter. <clears throat> when we realize that every time we meet as Christian people, Christ is next to us. And what we're doing is being Christ to the person next to us. There's a great story out of the 19th century. Thomas uh, More, who was an Irish poet, <clears throat> he got married and then very quickly went on a business trip to another, another place. And while he was gone, his young bride contracted smallpox. And she was so disfigured that she wouldn't let anybody see her. She pulled the curtains. And when Thomas More came back and wanted to see his wife, she said, no, I won't let you in because I am so disfigured. I don't want to give that impression to you. And so he said, okay. But that night he wrote a song. And he said to his wife, he says, I want to sing this song to you. Believe me, if all those enduring charms which I gaze on so finely today were to change tomorrow and flee from my arms like fairy gifts fading away, thou wouldst still be adored as this moment thou art. Let thy loveliness fade as it will, and round the dear ruin each wish of my heart would entwine itself burdenly still. And when he finished his song, his wife got out of bed, went over and opened the curtains and let the sunlight in. My friend, she was able to do that because of Thomas More love. But we were able to do that even more so because of the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I'm convinced that God wants us to be Christ to each other. God wants us to come alongside those who are hurting and those who are rejoicing and be there with them in every step of the journey. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is from Colossians 1. <clears throat> and it simply goes that the secret is simply this. Christ in you. Yes, Christ in you, bringing with him the hope of all the glorious things to come. Now think about that. The secret is simply this. Christ in you and me. You know, God took that chance. And he said, I'm going to leave behind me this community on earth and I'm going, to, I'm going to give myself to them, and then I'm going to trust them to be Christ to somebody else. I see that happening all the time in this church. That's why I like to preach on it. Because, my friends, there are sick churches, and there are healthy churches. And I've seen them. And the barometer of a sick or healthy church is simply is how much encouragement is going on in that congregation. How much support is going on? How much caring? How much being Christ to the other person is going on? We can have the best programs in the world. All the fanciest things you can imagine and not be the church. Because we're the church when we're Christ to each other. Albert Schweitzer was once asked, who is the greatest person in the world? And he said this, he says, the greatest person alive in the world at this moment is some unknown individual in some obscure place who at this hour has gone in love to be with another person in need. That's the greatest person in the world, to go and be with another person in need. My friends, God comes alongside of us. God helps us. God blesses us. God empowers us to be the church. And we need it with each other. And we need to communicate that to the world. That there is a place, no matter how bad things get in the world, there is a place where God's love is. And we experience that and we share that. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. We're going to sing, I love to tell the story. Number 560.
We thank you for your church that stretches around this world and stretches throughout time. You know, Lord, we need each other. We need to be encouraged and built up by our time together in worship, in fellowship, and in doing your work. We pray for your church. In many parts of the world, our brothers and sisters in faith are suffering. So we pray that you will strengthen them to be light to what is sometimes a dark world. We pray for our church, Lord. We give you thanks for the people of our church who support and encourage one another, who are there to come alongside of our members and friends to help and encourage. We pray always to help us to be sensitive to hear those silent cries for help. Help us to listen and to care deeply. Lord, we pray your guidance for our leaders during these difficult days, for our president and vice president for his administration, for our governor, for our local leaders. <clears throat> and we pray that you'll give them wisdom as they guide us. Lord, we also remember those who are going through difficult days. We pray for Arlene Seaman, Mark's mother, and his sister, and his family at, during this time of loss. We pray for John as you continue to heal him. We pray for Bob and Sharon, and for Bob and Chris, and we pray that you'll continue to heal Maybell. Lord, we pray too for Mary and Wasfix, brother-in-law, and her family, that you will bless them with peace during this time of loss. <clears throat> Lord, we know that there are others on our hearts, so we share those with you today. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers, and we bring these to you with the confidence that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, 
would you please bring forth our offering as we sing the doxology. we thank you for the many gifts that you give us. Thank you that you allow us to give back to you. And we pray that you'll take the gifts that we bring today, that you'll multiply them, use, use them for your purpose in this place and throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of departure is, We Have Heard the Joyful Sound, number 559. Let's make it joyful. 554. 554. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> today for worship. Our choir is going to sing a benediction response after I give, share the benediction. And please come downstairs for that time of fellowship. Uh, Dan and Cheryl have brought a lot of good things to eat and enjoy. As we go forth in this place of worship, God sends us out into the world, out into the world to say, Jesus saves, not just in the future, but right now. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.
Thank uh-huh.